Good afternoon and a very warm welcome to all of you joining us here today um, at Friends of Europe's Policy Insight on the UK's Integrated Review. My name is Domendra Kanani, one of the directors here, chief spokesperson for Friends of Europe. This is part of our Peace, Security, Defence programme and we're very pleased to be having uh, a discussion with you uh, and the key uh, architects, if you like, of the Integrated Review. Um, I'm very pleased to welcome a stellar cast uh, of contributors, but I know that also from the list that's joining and increasing by number, some few couple of hundred people that are joining us are also stellar in their roles and responsibilities. So a very warm welcome to you. Just a few rules of the game before we go into the debate uh, in earnest. Um, those of you who are Zoom savvy will know that you should keep your uh, self on mute. Uh, make sure your title's on there, and if you wish to raise a question, a query, please don't hesitate to do so, but using your virtual hand. Those of you who don't know where it is, go to the participant symbol and then press that and you'll see the little hand come up. Uh, so that'll be helpful. So that way you can indicate to me that you'd like to come in and make a contribution or raise a question and engage in the debate. I also want to welcome, uh, warmly welcome, our, our, our people that are watching on live stream, and you are not disincluded. Uh, please feel free to engage in the debate. You can post your questions or queries using hashtag FOE debate and we'll make, a, make an effort, a strong effort to include you also. So those are the rules of the game in terms of how we run this particular show. Um, I want to now first turn to the review itself. So those of you who have been both either within the UK or outside will know that this review has been heralded and, and I quote, the most radical reassessment of the UK's place in the world. Uh, Domestically, uh, it has been uh, viewed as somehow, depending where you stand, glass half full, others as glass half empty. Uh, there have been many commentators uh, that have felt that it's a great idea, perhaps low on content, and others say this is actually what we need and we need to build out and see what it means. For Europe, there was a bit of a gap and a silence, and many commentators here in Continental Europe in the EU felt there was no reference to what it meant to the special relationship um, that had been there for many, many years, but obviously Brexit changed all that around. So we are very pleased to be able to hear directly from those who are involved to understand what the implications of the integ integrated review means for both the UK, its relationship in the wider world, and but in particular, what it means for the EU. I want to turn first of all to one of the key protagonists behind the report, uh, someone who works at number 10, who is uh, uh, you know, Prime Minister Boris Johnson's uh, foreign policy advisor, uh, also author of Realpolitik, uh, one of the, uh, you know, the person in charge of the review team to come to, to discussion first. John, it's a very warm, very warm welcome to you and very good to see you here this afternoon. Thank you. I hope you can hear me okay. I can, um, John. Thank you. That's Excellent. very good. That's very good. So, John, um, it will be really helpful for all of us to understand um, not necessarily the nitty gritty. It's about trying to understand from your perspective um, do, what's the purpose of the review. Um, you've written in Real Politik about the notion of you know the loss of grand strategy. Is this an example of grand strategy? What's the purpose of the review? And say a little bit about what it what it constitutes, so that all of us understand what's involved. Over to you, John. Uh, well, thank you very much for that kind introduction and um, uh, hello to ladies and gentlemen. Um, if only we could do this in person, but I think we're all used to um, how tricky these things are and, and uh, uh, doomed to a fate of Zoom calls for, for a little bit longer. Um, well, you very kindly describe me as, as one of the architects of the review. Um, the first thing I'd say, and this is not a matter of being humble, uh, but it's an important fact, is that really there were many architects and, and, and many hands in the review. Um, uh, and that's important because this exercise and an exercise of this scale and this nature was uh, overdue in uh, the British system across the piece from national security to international policy in the round. Um, and, you know, these reviews happen normally every five years. Um, um, we were due on after 2015. Uh, we conducted it against the backdrop of COVID and Brexit negotiations, the US presidential election, so all these countervailing wins. Um, but I think there's a broad agreement it was, it was long overdue. And I think, to my mind, one of the most important aspects of the review is that it's a system-wide review. It's an integrated review across different um, elements of government policy. And that was kind of fundamental to what we wanted to do. Um, I would just uh, advert um, uh, your, your, your listeners and, and, and um, uh, participants to, to, to the fact that it's, it's not simply one isolated product. Um, so an important sort of staging point 
in setting up the ideas behind the review was the Prime Minister's speech at the Munich Security Conference. Uh, there's the review itself, but also the subsequent Defence Command paper, uh, and also kind of sometimes an underappreciated but very important document, uh, our Defence Industrial Strategy, um, published the day after the Defence Command paper. So it's a se sequence, uh, and we hope, particularly those most intimately involved in the review, it's not a, it's not also not the end of the strategy making process. Uh, and one of the things we want to achieve with the review is to continue that sort of continual strategic um, reassessment. So what does the review um, try to achieve? As I say, it's overdue, but other things were also overdue, I think, which we tried to respond to. Um, one is a kind of a definition of global Britain, this much discussed term. Um, I think perhaps t a little bit too mangled in the wheels of the Brexit conversation, but actually Indeed. something that meant uh, much, much more else uh, besides that. Um, also a response to uh, a changing international order. And I think we've seen, you know, many other friends and allies try to adapt to big geopolitical and ge big geoeconomic shifts. And some people talk about that in terms of great power competition. The phrase that we used, I think, in the document is systemic competition. But one of the things we also pointed out is that notwithstanding this return of competition, there are also still um, serious, acute transnational security challenges. And of course, in a way, we're living through one in the context of COVID-19. Um, so, so as I say, it was an attempt to answer some of those, those major questions. As to its audience, I think this is underappreciated, but important. There were, there were three principal audiences to review. Um, the first is those engaged in the delivery of national security and international policy across the UK government. Um, so it is intended as a strategic framework. It is intended as a guide to action. Mm -hmm. um, it sets a vision to 2030 uh, and a set of priority actions out to 2025. And in that sense, it is more obviously um, strategic uh, than, its, than its immediate predecessor. Um, um, you know, does it pass the close switch test? I'll leave others to decide that. But that was the, the first and most important audience. Mm -hmm. um, second, vitally, it's addressed to the British people um, and it explains how the British government seeks to use uh, um, uh, national resources to achieve the effects that it needs to to level up the country, uh, support our domestic agenda and strengthen the UK union. And that is kind of a vital, important part. And one of the things the review says is that we must do a better job of consciously delivering for the British people in our actions overseas. And again, we're not the only country to say that. I, I note what the Biden administration says about delivering for the American middle classes. There's many other examples across Europe as well. Uh, but that was the second audience. And, and a third and, and vital audience for us as well was our international partners and allies um, who've been sort of waiting for a kind of a statement of what global Britain means, uh, are waiting for a statement of the UK's position uh, on a range of issues. Um, so the review itself, as I say, um, uh, uh, is an attempt to define global Britain, but it also tells a story of this government's action so far in a range of um, uh, foreign policy um, uh, uh, areas. And I'll just pick, pick, pick a few. Mm. Perhaps the first kind of biggest, most consequential muscle movement, if you like, for um, European partners and friends, and this is absolutely channeled through in a, in, a, in a strong message on the need to reinforce NATO is, is an increase in defence spending, the biggest increase in defence spending since the end of the Cold War, but one designed around, focused on the notion of collective security, that absolutely fundamental pillar of NATO. That's the big muscle movement. But you've also seen uh, quite significant shifts and changes in British foreign policy in a number of other areas. And I just point to two on the, on the, on the human rights and democracy front. Um, the first is the introduction of uh, Magnitsky sanctions, uh, which the UK has used sometimes in concert with European friends and allies, sometimes in concert um, uh, with Canada, Australia or the United States uh, as a kind of fundamental tool of our, of our foreign policy. And then again, the, the kind of a, a big muscle movement was the um, uh, decision to change our uh, visa and immigration system. Uh, to allow for a, a path to citizenship for British nationals overseas in Hong Kong. Two, two big changes in British foreign policy uh, over the course of the last 18 months. So it told that story uh, up to where we were now, a stronger focus on deterrence and defence and collective security, uh, and also a stronger focus on values, uh, human rights and democracy. Uh, but what the review, um, uh, uh, what we didn't want to do the review is get too stuck in 2021, let alone 2020. Uh, for a number of reasons. First of all, we have quite a developed multilateral agenda and high ambition for uh, G7 and COP26. Um, and there was an early version of the review that was very, you know, laid, laid it on very thick in terms of what we hope to achieve over the course of, over the course of the next year. But we were conscious that we wanted to set out a strategic framework that went beyond that. 
uh, and, and allowed us to adapt in different policy areas uh, beyond that. So for the first time in a UK national security strategy, we set up these strategic uh, pillars in our strategic fr uh, framework, these four core strategic objectives. And I'll just zip through those um, before handing over to colleagues. Uh, the first, and I think this is this is pretty innovative for a UK national security strategy, um, was to seek strategic advantage in science and technology. Mm -hmm. uh, and that really, as much as anything, is about working with allies. I think the key word to my mind in the whole review is, is this phrase we use, co-creation. Um, so a focus on the need to work with allies and partners uh, to defend and nurture or cooperate with uh, certain areas of vital science and technology and an assumption that science and technology is becoming more and more important as a defining metric of uh, international influence and international power. The second is to shape the, sh the open international order of the future. And that was really a recognition that the UK, as a strong defender of the international status quo and international system, uh, needed to adapt to a more proactive approach that involved uh, 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 reinforcing those parts of the international system that were under threat or being weakened, uh, standing up for human rights and democracy, but also crucially shaping the open international order in future frontiers. So to take the digital economy or space or cyberspace, and we needed to have a more proactive approach in those areas. The third pillar was strengthening defence and security. As I say, that defining thing in terms of resource was this big increase in defence spending toward 24 billion on top of what was in the Conservative Party manifesto or in existing projections, taking the UK up to 2.2% uh, defence spending uh, this year. But, but if you look uh, more closely at the document, and, and Samantha may explain this a little bit more about this, that was very much focused on replenishing and renewing collective security. So not only collective security through the sharing of, of uh, uh, burden, uh, not only collective security through the sharing um, and commitment of resources, uh, but also the need to modernise deterrence, uh, to think more effectively about conflict prevention um, uh, and in a whole range of areas, which Samantha may go into further. And then the, the fourth um, um, final pillar, but by no means the least, was strengthening resilience. So previous UK national security strategies had adverted to resilience and talked about resilience, but we really define it more thoroughly in this document. And we put two things at the absolute centerpiece of resilience. The first is the need for strengthen uh, the global health system. Uh, and again, the UK has been at sort of forefront of efforts on Gavi and COVAX and CEPI and a pandemic, uh, a future pandemic treaty, um, uh, a pandemic preparedness treaty. Uh, but also vitally, and this kind of runs like through a stick of rocks through the whole review, this focus on, on climate change as our number one international priority, as it described at the start of the document. Uh, and that really leads up to, to, to COP26 and beyond. As I say, we think of climate change as, a, as that overriding international priority, not always the, the, the immediate foreign policy priority, Priority, but the overarching international priority uh, uh, to which we will focus. Um, so as I say, um, the strategic framework um, um, is, is supposed to set action out to, to 2024. If I was to sum it up in just a few words, I would yes, say be it's sciences, uh, alliances, uh, and values. Um, and, and this sort of final instrument is this notion of co-creation, uh, which is a kind of science-focused uh, notion of how you would work with allies and partners to, to shape shape and create uh, new norms uh, and new values in the international system. Now, I will stop there. Thank John, you. John, thank you for that. I think that it's very clear that the, the way you describe the review has gone out with the bounds of traditional defence and security uh, concerns, and you've broadened it very widely. You've referenced uh, climate and other matters. And then also you refer to the concept of co-creation, which to many will mean uh, uh, underpinning that is a sense of power sharing. And it will be interesting uh, what others make of it. Uh, and also, I suppose, in terms of uh, a long term strategy, it, the proof is in the pudding, actually, in the eating, because people want to understand what does it mean in practice when we, feel, you know, when we, uh, when we uh, encounter our first, uh, let's say, difficulty in the neighbourhood or elsewhere, what will that mean in practice in terms of capabilities, data sharing, uh, joining forces and doing th something both which is reactive but also preventive. Perhaps something to think about. Um, I want to bring in Samantha in a moment, but just to remind all of our colleagues on Zoom, um, you please, please feel free to use the Zoom chat. It's a great function. Um, if we don't get a chance to take all of you, please put your question down there and we can at least have it recorded and we'll make sure that if we don't have time in this short hour that we have with you, uh, we'll make sure speakers are able to respond to your questions uh, and they have done so uh, valiantly 
brilliantly in previous occasions with, uh, for Friends of Europe debates. So I'm sure the same will be the case here. Samantha, I want to bring you in now, uh, if I may. Samantha, you're, you are Director of, of Defence um, uh, and International Security at the Foreign, Commonwealth and Development Department. A very warm welcome to you, Samantha. Good to have you with us. Um, I need you to take yourself off mute. Are you off mute? Great. Hi. Great. So I think what we'll want to hear from you is um, we've heard the kind of big picture and the time scale and some of the, uh, I suppose, branding and tone around what this review is intended to be. But from your perspective, share with us, what are the key security themes running through the chapters and what therefore are the implications for partnerships, coalitions and alliances? We have NATO here, we have the EU here, we have ambassadors across, across the world in the audience. They want to know, they will want to know what does this actually mean in terms of some of the security themes and what it means for their relationships with you. Thank you very much and thank you for inviting me. This is a fantastic opportunity to talk to such a rich collection uh, of um, participants. What I thought I would do is um, speak a little bit more about the security angles, but I need to do that in the context which John set out, that this is not a classic defence review or national security strategy uh, that the 20th century might have, uh, have written for us. This is a fully integrated um, approach and that is because that is how we see the world that is how we see other actors operating that is how we think we need to um, be most effective on the international stage uh, to be able to pull all of those levers together um, the first chapter as John set out is on is on s and t and it's about keeping that strategic advantage through technology there are definitely opportunities here um, for diplomats like me and my team who do uh, space norms of behaviour, uh, as John referred to. But there's also an issue here of, of protection and um, being careful about who might be trying to come to the UK or uh, get access to UK science and technology for their own purposes. So there's a sort of investment security and uh, national security element to the, to the science and technology. But there's also a big collaborative element to science and technology, uh, as Jan, John put it. And anyone who's involved in the defence industry on this call will know it's, it, that the way that the industry is moving is very much collaborative across geographical boundaries as we develop our way into the future. The second section, which talks about essentially the UK's posture in the world, um, there is some change there. There has been a sort of public comment on our um, statement of sort of a, a tilt to the Indo-Pacific. Mm. But people who read the IR will see that that only comes after a section which is very clear about the UK and its um, geographical and security focus, starting with our neighbourhood. It's an unequivocal commitment to security for and the European and Euro-Atlantic area. Um, and we see this every day, how our delegation works uh, in NATO. We saw it with foreign ministers um, getting together and discussing these things uh, only last week. That is um, a message I sort of wanted to land today. Mm. It, it's um, something our ministers have been very clear to say that we might be leaving the European Union, but we're not leaving Europe. That sounds like a political soundbite, but if you actually scratch the surface of our levels of cooperation, um, and our intent and commitment to that security agenda, you will discover that that is a big priority for us. And it's also clear to us that the, um, the term John referred to as a sort of systemic competition or systemic challenge, um, that flows from an understanding of two things. One is that there are other systems um, that are uh, challenging democratic systems, and we wish to stand for, for democratic systems. And the other is this challenge to the international system itself. Mm -hmm. um, so in my uh, responsibilities includes uh, things like the OPCW in The Hague, the Chemical Weapons um, uh, Treaty and Institutions, which, which has been under attack. So there are many of those around the system where we want to uh, co-create, as John put it, by strengthening existing systems and de developing the ones for the future. But that needs to be, and you'll see this is the section of the report that talks about it, with our friends. We would love to be able to change the world on our own, but that is not the world we live in. Uh, we need to work um, through alliances, through partnerships, um, as you set out. The third chapter is the defence and security chapter, and I'm happy to talk uh, a bit more about that. One of the themes which John has talked about is modernising is being very clear-eyed about what future conflict might look like. 
Uh, if I were a, a military planner I, and I, I was given a, a scenario in which to think through how to get military advantage or how to um, try to achieve an objective in a military way, I would very, very quickly get to cyber and space. I would want to take mm -hmm. out people's communications. I would want to take out their imagery. So there's an angle of thinking about how we modernize our forces. But there is also a strand to make sure that when we say modernize, we also mean modernize conventional forces. We haven't stepped away from those. And we're thinking about how to um, make them technologically advanced and ready for the 21st century, um, but not in a way that reduces conventional deterrence. One of the things which is a theme in the defense thinking uh, in the UK is uh, a concept which in the integrated review is referred to as persistent engagement. Uh, which doesn't mean militarily, uh, military engagements, I hasten to add. What it means is greater engagement in the world, um, not only thinking as, of defence as one-off incidents, but as a, an ongoing continuum of partnership, of uh, whether that is through defence attaches, through dialogue, through training, through all of the different ways that we engage overseas. And it is part of, again, that concept about um, being fully integrated across all the international aspects of British policy. One of the big muscle moves that John didn't refer to is the fact that my job title has changed uh, in the last few months because I am now part of the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. Indeed. We've quite consciously brought those two ministries together for the same reason, because we want to have all of the um, international angles and influence and, uh, and um, impact uh, and offer to partners uh, and allies around the world in one place and, and operating coherently together. And so that fourth chapter on resilience, um, it is striking that we are thinking about resilience in a different way from how we might have thought about it a few years ago. We're thinking about resilience uh, across the spectrum from natural disaster to man-made aggression. Mm -hmm. And we've talked a lot about health security this year and climate security. Uh, but it's also striking to me that there is much more of a sense of a whole of society approach, mm -hmm. which I think other parts of Europe have, have done uh, maybe ahead of us slightly. But thinking that uh, security is something that everyone in society owns, whether that is making sure there's a password on your computer and getting your cybersecurity right, to an awareness and an understanding of the, uh, of the world that we live in. Um, and there is a sense of resilience doesn't only come by sitting and battening down the hatches in the UK. Resilience comes from alliances, partnerships, relationships, uh, and reaching out to others um, and building uh, where we can advice and support to others uh, on the resilience track as well. So where that brings me to um, the sort of Euro, Euro, Euro Atlantic space, I think it's it's not by uh, accident that both NATO and the European Union are thinking about this strategic picture. Mm -hmm. It's the strategic strategic concepts um, in NATO, it's a strategic compass in the European Union. Um, a lot of the people I have talked to internationally about the integrated review, and I've spoken to a, a good number in the last couple of weeks, have said to me either, I recognize that strategic picture of the world that you are describing, or uh, we are working through a similar set of issues uh, and context to work out our own international posture. So it does feel timely. It is a conversation we want to have um, with others. And it is a situation where we want to be acting with others from a common understanding and a common set of uh, approaches, as the UK has always done, to reinforce um, our capabilities to, to make a difference, which is, after all, what this is all about. I will Samantha, stop there. Thank, thank you. you very much. No, thank you very much. That's very, very clear. And I think one of the key, uh, I suppose, I'll, I'll, I'll bring our audience in uh, in a moment or two, but one of the key devices for being able to work in partnership uh, in the terms you describe, but also for reviews of this kind, is about understanding uh, current and future threats and doing a threat analysis, if you like. But that also requires data sharing and data understanding and having a protocol that we can all work together on. And that's been probably a bit of a, a thorny issue uh, uh, in many, many ways that we might want to come to. I'm sure some of our audience will want to come back to you on that. But before I do, I want to bring in Jamie Shea. Jamie, one of uh, he's our senior fellow at Friends of Europe, who's led our Peace Security Defence programme over many years. Jamie, a very warm welcome to you. Can I ask you to share some of your initial reactions to the review, please? 
Uh, well, first of all, uh, thank you, Darmendra, for giving me the chance to come in. Uh, hopefully, uh, I can be uh, heard uh, over there in Brussels. I'm in London at the moment, so I'm able to see the picture from both sides of the channel at the same time. Uh, thanks you very much, uh, John and Samantha. My own sort of sense is that this uh, inspires two big questions in my mind. Uh, the first question is to John, which is that global Britain, of course, has existed for many decades uh, in the years in which the UK was a member of the European Union. Uh, it had the special relationship with the U.S., still does. It's a member of the U.N. Security Council. Uh, it had the Commonwealth, a member of the Five Eyes, G7, the G20. So what I would be interested, John, uh, uh, and this is not a question about uh, leaving the EU and Brexit and replaying that, but it's a, a more strategic question, is when you looked at the integrated review uh, and you thought of how we sort of redefine global Britain when we're already global Britain, uh, what sort of capabilities did you think... Uh, you know, economic, defence, uh, others, cultural, that the UK would need to acquire uh, to be able to play this more independent global Britain? And can you be candid with us, uh, particularly with this uh, Brussels-based audience, and, and give a sense, this it doesn't get talked about a lot in the UK, but I think it's a fair question. Uh, generally, what sort of capabilities did you think that the UK was losing? Because there's always a price to everything uh, in uh, leaving the EU, uh, and on that candid assessment, how easy would it be for the UK in its new role uh, to reacquire those capabilities? So that, that's the first thought that comes to my mind. And Samantha, yeah. if I may very briefly, um, on the defence side, uh, I totally uh, understand this issue that technology really matters and modern armed forces have to be stealthy and technologically, technologically enabled. Uh, and uh, the uh, defence uh, command paper says some interesting things about that. But we have at the same time a very ambitious uh, role for the UK, reinforcing NATO. The UK has big commitments there already, uh, some deployments now in Africa. Uh, and, of course, the idea now of a, of a more persistent uh, military presence in the Asia-Pacific. Uh, so I would like to ask Samantha, again, candidly, you know, what is the trade-off here uh, between uh, quantity and quality, between very high-tech but niche capabilities and the kind of mass, you know, to be in Asia one needs ships, one needs aircraft, uh, one needs uh, uh, a lot of backup, uh, one needs logistical supply chain. So what is the uh, the trade-off there uh, between technology and mass? Uh, and uh, where would you see uh, some of the, uh, the stress factors uh, that might okay. occur uh, if it becomes difficult to have, on the one hand, uh, a global presence, but on the other hand, a uh, very high tech, but inevitably uh, smaller niche capabilities. So, Domendra, thanks a lot for letting Jamie, me Jamie, thank uh, you. Those are my two points. Excellent questions. But you'll know, Bum, from having worked within public systems, the moment you say candid, it kind of curls the hair on the back of the neck of people who are working within civil society, civil service, especially number 10 and in government. But let's see what John uh, and Samantha have to say about that and how candid they can be in the context of this debate. But before I do turn back to them, I want to bring in a couple of people. So again, I, I say to all of you, don't hesitate to use your virtual hand. There's many of you here. Take the opportunity as much as possible to engage in the debate. I want to bring in Alexandra. Alexandra Escocia. Yes, thank you so much for bringing me in, and I hope that you can hear me. I and, can. Uh, Alexandra, for the benefit of our audience, please introduce yourself and then be yes. specific and clear about your question, if I may, because I've got many people that I need to run through. But very warm welcome course, to thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm Deputy Permanent Representative of France to NATO and uh, uh, have uh, a lot of friends in the audience here. But um, we already had a great presentation of the, of the review at Council, and thank you very much for that. Um, I just wanted to ask two questions specifically of, of uh, both uh, speakers, actually. Uh, one is about uh, the shape of the future UK-EU UK relationship on which the review uh, says a little bit, but we are still left with some uh, uh, wanting more, a little bit, some of us. Uh, and the second one is um, a very simple. How do you intend to carry on the values agenda that you talk about in the review within the NATO context? Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Two, again, very good questions. I now want to move to Ian. Ian Bond. You're muted, Ian. No, I'm not any longer. You're not Thank any you longer. Much. Warm welcome to you. Please, for the benefit <laughs> of the audience, again, introduce yes. yourself. Yeah, I'm Ian Bond. I'm a former British diplomat and currently the um, Director of Foreign Policy at the Centre for European Reform. 
Um, yeah, so, I, I mean, both the integrated review and the Defence Command paper are interesting documents. I, I've read them with, um, with fascination. I mean, at the end of the day, I thought it was a comprehensive review. I, I wasn't convinced that it was an integrated review. Um, and uh, I, I had two sort of specific questions in this. I mean, one is that obviously the decision to merge the FCO and DFID was taken long before the, the review was published, but it's still not, it seems to me, terribly well explained in the integrated review what advantages we we think we're going to get from this, particularly now that we have made deep cuts, uh, which I understand the economic background to, but deep cuts in the uh, in the aid budget um, for at least the next few years. Um, so that's that's one question, and the the second question um, is that um, although there is a lot of emphasis on presence and deployability and expeditionary capabilities for the military, the big thing that jumps out is the increase in the number of nuclear warheads that we're going to have. And for the first time in a very long time that I can remember, a specific description of our forward presence in Estonia as a tripwire. And that's, that's a very loaded phrase for those of us who are old and used to deal with nuclear issues. Indeed. 30 or, your, or more years Absolutely. ago. Absolutely. So, so um, perhaps okay. John or Samantha can explain to us, you know, is that a tripwire in the sense that we used to use it? Are we actually intentionally lowering the nuclear threshold and saying that nuclear weapons will play a bigger role in our um, armed forces and in our strategy than they did before? Indeed. And also, I think, the audience, as you are a notable figure, as many people in the audience, you'll know the answer to that question yourself also and have a view. It would be great to share your views on this because, uh, you know, uh, the way you pose it is absolutely self-evident. I want to move to a couple of other people before I also bring bring in Rose Gottemeyer, who is obviously ex an, uh, uh, Deputy, Secretary, uh, Deputy uh, Secretary General of the NATO. Uh, but before I do that, Alexei, have I got oh, that oh, name yes, right? Gronkia? Yes, Alexei, sir. hello, a warm welcome to you again. Please do introduce yourself. And I'm going to say to everybody now, no more two questions. You can only have one question each. It's gone. The goodie bag of two questions each is gone. It's one per person, please. Otherwise, I'm not going to get to the end of this debate. Alexei. Uh, thank you. My name is Alexei uh, Gromyko. I am from the Russian Academy of uh, Sciences and the director of the Institute of Europe. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the significant part of the review is uh, dedicated to the uh, British uh, deterrence. Uh, and for example, the review says that the UK will move to an overall nuclear um, uh, warhead stockpile of no more than uh, 260 warheads, uh, meaning that the, that the ceiling is going to be traced from 180 to 260. Uh, so my uh, question to John Bue, uh, could the uh, UK be willing in the foreseeable future to join the uh, US-Russia uh, consultations on strategic stability beyond New START? And if yes, then uh, under what uh, conditions? Thank you. Alexa, very, very powerful question again. Thank you very much. I think this is going to be one of those events where we're going to have a re range of these consistently, one after the other. Um, I want to bring Helene. Helene Conway, More? Yes. Helene, can you hear me? I can. Hello. Warm welcome yes. back to, again, one of the friends. But please do introduce yourself to, for the benefit of our audience, please. Um, thank you. I'm a French senator, member of the Senate, and uh, I'm the secretary of the uh, uh, Foreign Affairs, Defence and Armed Forces Indeed. Committee in the Senate. Um, thank you very much for a most interesting uh, presentation uh, from John and Samantha. And I, I'll have to say I fully agree with the, the global approach that you have that combines diplomacy, defence and develop, de development aid. Um, I'm currently working on the parliamentary report 
on the EU strategic compass. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I, if, if I may just have one and a half question just to ask John and Samantha if okay. they see uh, the document, very uh, comprehensive document they have produced, even though they're not the only architects, I heard, um, uh, to be joining both the work that's being done by the EU and, uh, and NATO. But I would like to know, as the UK has not drifted in the ocean, uh, it just left the European Union, in what form um, and what could a structure uh, a European defence industry for the next decades? Uh, we have both uh, uh, the staff in France uh, that we're working on with Germany and um, Spain, and um, the UK has the Tempest uh, programme. So I'd like to hear them on, on how do, you, do they see the future industrial defence cooperation with France and, and uh, maybe the EU? Thank you. Helen, thank you again. A very good question. I now want to, before I go back to uh, John and, and Samantha, I want to bring in Rose. Rose Gottmuller. Hello, Rose. You're I am here. Hello. Very warm welcome to you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. For the benefit of our audience, please do just introduce yourself very briefly. Yes, thank you very much. Many in the audience will uh, know me as the former Deputy Secretary General of NATO. I left NATO in October of 2019. I'm currently the Payne Distinguished Lecturer at Stanford University's Freeman Spoli Institute. Rose, give us give us your reaction to the review. I mean, you you know you've been at the utmost uh, you know structures of NATO. You're now in America. What does it what is, what does it kind of um, sing to you or otherwise about the future of the transatlantic relationship and more broadly about coalition building and that phrase we re we've heard earlier about co-creation. What's your reaction? Well, I welcome it. I welcome it very much, and Sarah has already said it uh, very well indeed. She's been consulting at NATO headquarters and, and with the EU as well in, in recent uh, weeks. But it is a very timely from the perspective that NATO is finally in its uh, NATO 2030 process, getting down to looking at a new strategic concept. So I think that the review, the integrated review that, and the, the very thoughtful process that the UK has gone through can only help uh, and support NATO in its efforts uh, to fashion a new strategic concept for the first time since 2011. So I welcome it, uh, I welcome it very, very much from that perspective. I do have some somewhat sharp questions for uh, both, <laughs> of, both John and Sarah, however. What are they? All right, first of all, and this picks up on uh, Jamie Shea's uh, question earlier, but I wanted to ask John if you don't think you've gone too broad. Um, I was very, very struck in reading through some of the basic information about uh, the review when there was, and, and a very good, I think, notion laid out that there should be uh, a attention to global deployments, and in fact, that there should be uh, early uh, signals that uh, that the UK will be playing a role in the Indo-Pacific. And so, therefore, is announced a 2021, um, uh, uh, 2021 uh, process in which HMS Queen Elizabeth will lead a multilateral task group on a global deployment, including to the Indo-Pacific. That, to me, seemed to, in some ways, uh, contradict notions elsewhere where you're emphasizing the need to develop new technologies, the need to develop to develop uh, new capabilities to contradict the notion that uh, you would be in this very welcome new approach to defense industrial policy, but you would be reversing the trend of fewer and increasingly costly platforms. The two notions juxtaposed HMS Elizabeth and the notion of moving toward less costly platforms uh, in the search for, for uh, a better application of emerging and new technologies, to me, these seem somewhat to contradict each other. So I wonder if you could talk okay. about how you're going to strike that balance. Indeed, both Ian and Jamie brought up uh, questions of that kind. And my second uh, question goes back to the point that several have raised about the uh, this quite striking uh, rise in number of nuclear warheads. I understand that the number 260 is a ceiling, not a target. I also took note that uh, the point was made that uh, the UK will keep its nuclear posture under constant review in light of the international security environment 
and actions of potential adversaries. So as Washington is now undertaking a review of uh, all of its uh, nuclear policies and related, of course, to uh, nuclear arms control and non-proliferation, how are you thinking about managing that ceiling, not a target, in the light of what may be happening in Washington's review and also in light of, as Alexei Gromyko uh, put it, the strategic stability discussions upcoming between Washington and Moscow. Thank you. Rose, again, as or ever, very insightful. Thank you very much for your insightful questions. And all, those of uh, all the others that have come in. I want to now go back to um, uh, John um, and Samantha, if I may, because I've got less than 20 minutes. I want them to be short in the response so I can take many more of you in the time that I have. So first, John, I'm not going to go through every, every detail question, but there are big questions about, you know, Global, really? Um, haven't you always been global? What do you mean by global in terms of quality, qu qu capabilities? What was missing that's not actually there at the moment? You've got stuff there around values. Uh, the question from Alexei about, and what Rose has suggested also, is that have you gone too broad? And actually, what about nuclear? And what do you do about stability mechanisms? So let's deal with that bag of stuff first. Then I'll turn to Samantha for the remainder. So, John. Excellent. Um, thank you. I mean, there's, in my position, there's a there's a, a, a limit um, um, to, to to how candid uh, the phrase I, uh, that was Indeed, used. Indeed, uh, I know. <laughs> I can be in terms of going into detail, and yeah. I'll, let, I'll let Samantha pick up some of the, the trickier ones on that uh, on that side of things. Um, I mean, she may want to, to pick up without putting words in her mouth that strategic stability point, um, which is important, very important, and uh, and uh, it is discussed. Uh, in the review, um, I'll, I'll just take a kind of uh, a, a, a bunch of questions that kind of nudge towards the um, the global Britain too broad um, question. I mean, first of all, I take I take Jamie's point as to UK already having a global security perspective, um, uh, correct um, uh, uh, and entirely accurate. Um, and um, what this review attempts to do is is is, is talk about that a little more precisely. Um, and this is where I think it answers the too broad. Um, question a, a close reading, and this is this is to be clear, this is not me extrapolating or or um, riffing off the back of the review, but it's all in the context of the review, um, and it's all in, in, in black and white in there. I mean, I mean, the first thing as we assessed uh, interests um, and we assessed our, uh, assessed our kind of existing position in the international order, it was quite clear that our um, interests are global as well as they are European, um, and in some respects, we're becoming more global um, from economic interests through to security interests. Um, secondly, that our, our perspective was global, as Jamie said, um, and um, would remain so, but that in itself as a P5 member um, imposed um, certain uh, uh, responsibilities. Uh, as well uh, as to as to that broader perspective, and of course, there's always a balance, and there's always a trade a trade off ac across the piece. But you know, to be more precise about that, um, uh, I think the document is actually quite clear about global Britain. It says a number of things that are that are that were reinforced uh, in the Prime Minister's statement before the review and the statement after, um, which is you know the, the UK is not in any way sort of. Um, Packing its bags uh, and becoming less European in leaving the Euro in, in leaving the European Union, um, and I think that's a, that's an important thing. It was really strongly stated in the review. Um, there has been that that pre-existing uh, and strong and reinforced and increased commitment to NATO vis-a-vis uh, -vis resources. Um, you know, the UK is up to 2.2% um, this year, and and um, you know, I think UK is one of the countries who believe that metric still matters. It's not everything, uh, but it but it is but it is something. Um, um, so that, that there is a kind of broad increase in resources. Secondly, it says that the precondition of global Britain, so the precondition of having this broader perspective and approach, is the security of our homeland and the Euro-Atlantic area. And it's kind of emphatically clear in that. And then when it talks about the involvement in deeper areas of the world, uh, in different areas of the world, I mean, like all these reviews, they, they go around and discuss important relationships, um, uh, alliance systems, etc. cetera. Um, but it does talk in particular about... Um, uh, East Africa plus uh, Nigeria and West Africa it talks about the Gulf and the Indian Ocean. Um, it talks about the importance the UK places in, in, in certain international organisations, and it's quite precise um, uh, about those. And in, in, insofar as it talks about the Indo-Pacific, it's very clear that it's a diplomacy-first approach, and that is not always uh, resource-dependent. I just say two things about that. So if, if you were, I, I started by saying that you know uh, one of our key audiences is the, the, the British people. Uh, as to explaining why comparatively across the range of soft power to, to hard power capabilities, if you like, the UK spends 
uh, quite a quite a lot um, compared to most nations on what you might call global public goods. Um, so, you know, um, having been the most generous development donor in the G7, um, temporarily, in, in that's let's all agree, unique economic circumstances, um, becoming the second most generous development donor in the G7 by portion by portion of uh, uh, by proportion of GNI, um, to being. Um, at 2.2 percent, one of the few countries that meets its NATO 2 percent target uh, and indeed exceeds it, and then combine those two things together. Um, let's say, the, let's say the UK is the the, um, the fifth largest economy in the world; it has the fourth largest dip diplomatic network. So you know the resources are kind of they're, they're pretty substantial, mm -hmm. um, uh, even in the context of a pandemic. Um, John, if um, I may, because I'm, I'm John, if I'm running out of time, so if I can ask you just kind of um, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll very, I'll very briefly wrap very up. Very brief, that point. briefly. And but do focus on the is... apparent contradictions and the issue about nuclear as well, because I think that's important to get a response to. Back over to you, John. Uh, I'll let Samantha pick up on, on the nuclear side okay. of things, um, but but just very very briefly on the, on the second thing, it, 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 you know, it's it, it, the the, the co-creation and the diplomacy first approach is not always resource dependent, and I think it's a mistake to to think of things that are entirely resource dependent. Uh, so I'll give you two examples as to what it says about deeper involvement in the Indo-Pacific. It's about working within and around uh, and two existing regional organisations. So take uh, dialogue partner status at ASEAN or accession to CPTPP. Uh, these these are not self they're not all resource dependent. And just a final kind of point on Global Britain. It's, a, it's an interesting one, having kind of been, been through around it. The further you get away from London, uh, the more popular the notion is. Um, so um, I think there's a kind of still a bit of an allergic reaction. Um, as, you know, the, the civil war of Brexit uh, continues. But actually, what's very striking in conversations with allies and partners around the world uh, is, is the question is not, you know, what is global Britain? We don't want global Britain. It's it's uh, what is the constancy? What does it mean in terms of resource? Um, what does it mean in terms of a longer period of time? And, and we do try and answer that as far as possible in, in, in the five year time frame. But I'll, I'll stop there and hand over to Samantha. Thank you, John. And I will come back for both of you to conclude uh, because I want to bring a couple more people in. Samantha, um, the ball's been passed to you to be more candid. <laughs> That's always fun. Um, I'll go through some of the issues that were raised very quickly. But again, quickly. also quite brief, um, briefly, if you can, in your response, that would be helpful. So the, the relationship with the European Union on um, industrial uh, development is something that we will keep under review. We're looking very closely at how PESCO operates, how third countries uh, get access to that and interact with that. We will be uh, watching that before we start taking any decisions uh, on how we do that. And I think it will be the same for the overall um, security and defence uh, relationship. The relationships with um, individual member states are very strong. Uh, we don't think we need an overarching kind of formal agreement to have uh, relationships with the European Union themselves as well. But that is still a, peri uh, a period of building um, will be required there. But the work with, uh, with small groups of different European uh, nations um, on the military security side will be, will be well known to this audience. Um, secondly, I would say that uh, the advantages of foreign policy and development coming through together, I hope everyone has seen that the integrated review makes very clear that um, the British government wants to get back to 0.7 as soon as economic circumstances allow. That is the intent. And as John said, this is a longer term um, uh, a longer term framework than, than just one for this year. Uh, we think there is there are benefits to bringing together foreign policy and development policy in terms of, uh, of impact and engagement, or, or uh, obviously we wouldn't have done it. Um, I will just come to this question about uh, the nuclear uh, language in the integrated review. I would say it is um, really important that people understand that our nuclear doctrine has not changed. The United Kingdom has always had a minimum credible deterrent. What has happened in reviewing um, specifically the warhead numbers, which has been a long time since we looked at, is that the strategic situation we find ourselves in uh, has required us to do the, re the reviewing which uh, somebody just quoted, you know, keeping the posture under review. Well, this is what we did. We reviewed it. And that has required um, that minimum number to change slightly. Not from 180, I hasten to add. 180 was a figure we wished to get to at some point in the mid-2020s. Well, we're not in the mid-2020s, and the circumstances around us have changed. So what's actually happened is a very small tweak from uh, 225 up to potentially, if we need it, 260, which is still um, the smallest nuclear arsenal uh, of the, among the P5, as people will know. And what I want to make clear is that our commitment to 
um, our nuclear doctrine, doctrine and posture has not changed, but our commitment to um, the arms control disarmament agenda, which the UK has always uh, been an active uh, member of, that has not changed either. Uh, and I've just come from a cross whole discussion on arms control. I'm, you know, we're already working through the P5, um, uh, as our Russian colleague will know, to work to prepare what we can say at the uh, MPG review conference later this year. So the, the fundamental picture hasn't changed. What's happened is that the, the numbers have needed to change in response to this strategic so your um, posture scenario. On so, you're, so you're saying that your posture on nuclear hasn't changed despite what you're doing in terms of investments. Is that what you're saying? Correct. Okay. All right. So some of the people have responses to Alexa and others. Get, of course, you will have other thoughts and comments. And sorry to cut you short, but I wanted to ask you very specifically. You heard from Helen and others about, you know, the other reviews that are taking place. Is it your intention to participate in those? We've lost you, Samantha. Obviously, we're uh, part of the process already uh, and we have shared thoughts with the European Union um, to, to inject into the uh, strategic uh, compass as well. So we're already involved in both of those. Okay. We had a long round and, and John was extremely good at this, international engagement as we put our thinking together uh, and we're happy to continue international engagement as other people are developing their own strategies as well. Great, thank you. I'm running out of time, so I'm going to, you know, pray upon you to stay on for another five or so minutes, so I can just rush through a couple of people who have been so patient. I want to go to, um, basically, to um, Iverson. Ng? Yeah. Hello. Hello. Very. I yeah, need so, you to be um, very brief. Introduce yourself very quickly, and then what your yeah, question of is. Of course. Hello, everyone. My name is Iverson. Um, so I'm a graduate of the Russia Studies at the University of Tartu in Estonia. I'm a columnist as, uh, at an Estonian newspaper, and I'm a British national in Hong Kong. So my question is regarding the Chinese exploitation of Hong Kong's autonomous status to export uh, the authoritarianism globally. So uh, as John mentioned in the beginning that uh, the British government has offered the British national overseas uh, uh, a pathway to become a British, uh, to have British citizenship uh, in response to the to the violation of the Santa Bridge Stone Declaration, which is uh, legally valid as well as uh, let, uh, listed in the UN. So my question is, uh, given that Hong Kong's uh, privilege of um, uh, initiating and negotiating uh, trading agreements as well as um, uh, participation in other international uh, organizations. That means like China ha has a privilege of manipulating that. So why the British government is still granting okay. um, the autonomous status of Hong Kong and why the British government is not uh, stopping to, to recognize uh, the, the uh, autonomous status of Hong Kong in order to uh, respond to the um, Great. Uh, the, the happening in, in uh, Hong Kong. Iris, the, uh, thank you. Security no, thank you for bringing that put that point in, and I'm hoping that we can get back to you on some of, some of the point the, the very specific question about Hong Kong. I want to turn to Bruno. Bruno Rice, you've been very patient. Hello, a warm welcome to you, Bruno. Introduce yourself very briefly to the audience, and then what your question is. Uh, hello, Dermendra. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm I'm currently uh, an advisor to the um, Portuguese Minister of Defence. I'm also. Uh, very proud uh, alumnus of, of Cambridge and, and King's. Uh, so first of all, congratulations on, on a job well done. I know these kind of strategic reviews are, are difficult. And I think uh, you managed to produce a, a very interesting document, of course, with limitations and uh, open to criticism, but but still very, very well done. Um, I, 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 I noticed that uh, you mentioned Portugal as, as a possible partner. So I I also wanted to welcome that. Uh, we are certainly interested in, in cooperating with, with Britain uh, in a number of areas. Uh, but my specific question has to do with uh, with maritime security. Okay. Uh, of course, there are a few mentions in, in the document, but what, in your view, are the main uh, challenges there and what are also the main opportunities for cooperation? And, and you see that primarily in terms of NATO, primarily in terms of EU, or primarily in terms of bilateral cooperation. Bruno, thank with, you. With, with thank you very countries. much. Thank you. Thank you very much for being with us also. I want to turn to, and I want to bring in Paul Taylor, who's been very, very patient with one of our fe other fellows. But before I do so, Tony, Tony Brenton, hello. You're on mute. Hi, and thank you very much for letting me in. I'm a former British ambassador to Moscow. And my question is a very straightforward one. Um, since the big thinking that's gone into the review has taken place, we've seen a really quite sharp deterioration in the West's relations, the UK's relations, the US's relations with Russia and China. We've seen Biden call Putin a killer. 
and the Russians withdraw their ambassador in response. We've seen the Chinese response to our sanctions on them for what's going on in Xinjiang. We've seen the row in Alaska. It's pretty clear mm -hmm. that we're in for a, a rather rougher ride uh, in East-West relations over the next few years than perhaps had been anticipated when the review was being written. So I'd be grateful to hear from Samantha and from John as to how they would adjust their conclusions if they had known all that at the time that they were writing. Thank you, Tony. A very good question. Um, I'm, I'll, I'll let them deal with that, obviously. Before I go to um, back to our, 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 our contributors, Paul, Paul Taylor. Hello. Hi, uh, Do Paul Taylor, hello, friends of Europe. Um, thanks, Damendra, and thanks for a presentation of a, a fascinating exercise. I mean, real uh, blue sky thinking. It does raise a lot of questions. Some of them have been asked, so let me just put a few points telegraphically. There is, I think everybody would, most people would accept, an EU-sized hole in this strategic vision. Um, I understand why it may not be possible to fill that hole now. You know, the divorce crockery is still flying around in the air, and uh, uh, I, however, I do hope that we're not going to wait till 2030 to do it, because uh, I think we're likely to be mugged by events much sooner. Uh, and I think that the UK uh, has to, if it's realistic about, about the future, it needs to have a structured relationship with the EU and not just bilateral relations with uh, groups of countries on an ad hocery. Secondly, um, I'm old enough to remember that we, uh, you know, when we withdrew from east of Suez. Now we're going back uh, east of Suez. Um, what, what, what exactly, how, how much of an Asian power are we going to be? What are we actually going to do with those aircraft carriers when we get there? And how plausible is it for the UK to be, to project power so far uh, from our home base? Um, my third one is about NATO. You, you're bigging up NATO, and I understand that, especially since NATO is now your uh, your vehicle for influence in the in, in Europe, where you used to have the the two legs of NATO and EU membership. But um, at the same time, you're shrinking the army to the point where, unless the NATO force goals have changed, uh, you're no longer going to be in a position to provide the armored division for the defense territorial defense of Europe. And that's been very much the thrust of NATO thinking ever since 2014 and Crimea was, we need to do more for territorial defense. Looks like the UK is going in the opposite direction. Is that because you expect NATO to as well? Or is that just the means that you have? A um, couple more thoughts. They have I to be brief, been... I'm afraid, Paul. I'm yeah. so sorry, because I'm running out of time. You've been, you've been very balanced on, on, on China. Uh, uh, and certainly not as demonizing as, uh, as some of the public discussion is. Um, that, that brings you quite close to the EU uh, as well. Um, don't you think that there, in, in particular, working together on China, um, if the EU and the United States are going to be working together on China, shouldn't you be working with the EU on China too? And finally, um, I'm a little concerned about your vision of the future of war. I mean, you know, you rightly point to the fact that there's now this continuum where there's lots of things happening below the threshold of warfare, and you say potentially above as well. Um, but that raises the question, if we have thinner, smaller forces, however nimble they are, and we have less to deal with conventional warfare, doesn't that inevitably raise, uh, lower the nuclear threshold? Thank you. Paul, as ever, thank you. Very thoughtful and comprehensive. Um, I wanted to uh, uh, bring Rose back in, but unfortunately Rose has had to leave. Um, I want to go back to both uh, John and Samantha. If I can ask you to not to go to the, every specific question, but wrap up your you know, concluding remarks around responding to some of these very big questions, very interesting questions that obviously a review of this kind, especially from the UK, would generate. So I'm going to start with Samantha first. Thank you. I will pick up a couple of the, the themes coming through. Clearly, there's a question here about um, working with the European Union. I think the UK will be ready to work with the European Union, but I think it's also a priority for a lot of people that, that NATO and the European Union work together, that the two partners uh, are become partners in security, including some of these new, newer areas of technologies and resilience. 
so that the two organizations are reinforcing one another and raising everybody's security uh, and that they don't become somehow in competition and really Oh, that, that we've, nah. both of those agendas can move forward together. Um, and secondly, to uh, the, the question of, are we getting a rougher ride than we predicted? I suspect not. I suspect this is exactly the sort of rougher ride that we were thinking about as we did the analysis that, that underpins this review. Um, and then on maritime security, uh, there is a there is a lot of detail in that, so I can't get to it all of it here, but some of it is about the rule of law and the, the UN convention, uh, and some of it is about working with partners um, in all it's sort of different dynamics. We have the G7 at the moment, and that in includes working on, you know, Friends of the Gulf of Guinea uh, around maritime security in West Africa. So there are lots of, it's going to be a multidimensional uh, uh, agenda, I think, there. Thank you very much. Thank you to everyone. I'm afraid I have another speaking engagement now, so I'm going Indeed. to need to drop out. But this has been a really productive afternoon. Okay. Thank you very much. Well, we, thank you very much for, for, for joining us, and we will post you the questions that have been uh, put on the chat so you have the opportunity to be able to reflect and re respond to colleagues that have joined us. But Samantha, thank you very much. Um, John? Uh, I'm afraid I'm also going to have to leave, such, such as life and government. Um, I, I have another speaking engagement straight after this. Uh, okay. But thank, thank you for the questions. I don't have a huge amount to, to add to what Samantha elegantly covered and, and uh, much appreciate the questions and, and the spirit in which they were delivered. And thank you for, for hosting the event. John, thank you very much. Well, colleagues, as you can see, uh, we will use the chat function to be able to raise and forward your questions. I hope you've found this to be an effective, interesting, interactive debate. And obviously, um, uh, unfortunately, colleagues had to leave uh, in, the, in the manner they did. But I don't think that that's a, a sign of any lack of commitment to the union or other matters that you've raised. But we will make sure that we th these, these issues are aired uh, with them directly. And we hope to see you again soon. Um, thank you. And uh, obviously, continue to uh, engage in our website for our next offerings. We have a very significant peace security defence programme. And those of you who are interested will can tune in tomorrow at two o'clock, where I'll be in conversation with the Minister of Defence from Portugal, um, João Corvino, um, uh, talking about the Portuguese pr presidency's priorities for the EU. Uh, in terms of its you know, presidency. So if you're interested, please do tune into that and log on and um, see what he has to say in conversation with myself, Darmendra Kanani. Well, thank you, colleagues. It's been great to uh, engage with you uh, and see you again very soon. Take care, mind your distance and stay safe. Thank you very much for engaging with us. Bye-bye. <laughs>